Father in heaven, we thank you for the assurances of your word, God. We admit, God, that we need you because where would we be if it were not for you on our side? Where would we be, God, without your sustaining power, without your mighty hand? So, Father, as we open your word to hear what it is that you have to say to us today, God, we pray that you will carry us up to the throne room of heaven so that when we've left this place, God, we'll leave here different than the way we came. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory that will be due your name. In the most precious name of Jesus, I pray. Let everybody say amen. Amen, amen. We are continuing in our series on Daniel, and ironically, in prayer meeting, we're already up to Daniel 5. And so if you haven't been at prayer meeting, you've been missing it, but we're going to come reach back and, and, and for our preaching series. Uh, we're, there, we're there now in Daniel, the third chapter, and I want to pull up a particular portion of Scripture that I want to implant in your spirit, which provide the backdrop for what we're going to be talking about this morning. You all are good. The, the Bible says in Daniel, the third chapter, starting with verse 26. Daniel, the third chapter, starting with verse 26. The Bible says, if you all can read this together with me, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, or the Ghetto Version, as I like to call it. Then Nebuchadnezzar, come, let's read together. Then Nebuchadnezzar, or can you all see it? Let's start again. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, let's read together. Had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads were singed. And their clothing was not scorched. They didn't what? They didn't even smell of smoke. Next verse. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race, or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no God who can do what? Who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of of Babylon. I want to talk to you this morning from the subject fireproof. Fireproof. Uh, now we've been in this series for quite some time or from or we started it quite some time ago with Pastor Graham who did chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Daniel but just in a way of prolegomena or context I want to unpack what we've been talking about so far. Uh, Daniel the first chapter what we saw was we saw King Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC come into Israel and remove from Israel all of the uh, all of the smartest and the brightest and men of Israel or of the southern kingdom that had the most potential. We were there, right? And what we saw was King Nebuchadnezzar uh, decided that he was going to do some things in order to help these Hebrew children make the transition from their godly ways to Babylonian ways. And we saw the first thing that King Nebuchadnezzar did to these Hebrew boys was uh, he took their names from them. They had Hebrew names that their parents gave them uh, after their weaning time. And in, in the Hebrew culture, your name meant something. It was synonymous with what your character was. And Nebuchadnezzar took these young boys' names and gave them Babylonian names. They gave, he gave to Daniel, Belteshazzar, and he gave the others uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But not only did he take them from their homeland and change their names, King Nebuchadnezzar decided he was going to have them educated in his university. 
Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were all placed under the care of his most trusted advisors, his magicians and his scholars and his, uh, and his sorcerers. They were to train Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel in the ways and customs of Babylon. We saw in the, the first chapter of the book of Daniel also, we saw that the king not only would ch took them from their homeland and changed their name and uh, educated them in their ways, but the king also decided he was going to change their diet. Now before we get all happy as Adventists and pat ourselves on the back, don't worry, the king had vegetables and fruit on his table too. He had grains, seeds, and nuts, and probably some Loma Linda Boca patties as well. However, the king, what they would do is when they would get their food or when they would get their meat or whatever it is that they had, they would sacrifice their food to idols. So when we sit down and say our blessing to bless our food, instead of praying to God to bless their food, they prayed to their idols. Somebody say amen. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel decided in their heart that they would not defile themselves with the king's meat. And they challenged the king to take your choice men and we will, fat, uh, we, we, we will eat just fruits and vegetables and drink a little bit of water. And at the end of the appointed time, you can compare us to how we are to those people that eat meat from your table. And we see it in the, book, uh, in the first chapter of the book of Daniel that the king not only took them from their place and changed their name and educated them and changed their diet, but Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego were stronger. They were brighter. They were quicker not only in their bodies but in their minds than the other people who decided to eat meat from the king's table. And what we saw in the story of Daniel, the first chapter, is that here Israel experienced one of their greatest defeats. But here the Bible was showing us that even in defeat, God can get some victory. That victory can be found even in defeat. And if we go a little further, the Bible tells us in Daniel, the third chapter, about the third reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. And this dream that he had troubled him so much in his sleep. He had a nightmare. This dream troubled him so much that it awoke him. And, and, and the Bible tells us that not only was the king uh, completely amazed by the dream, he couldn't remember it. Now, uh, if, you, uh, if you told me a dream, I could make up some stuff about what your dream meant. I could be like, oh, you saw pretty flowers? Oh, those flowers, that means something new is going to spring up in your life. I could make it up. But the Bible tells us Nebuchadnezzar came and called all these people together, and he told them, not only do I want you to interpret the dream, but I want you to tell me what I dreamt in the first place. Now, somebody, uh, someone who's really thinking about it, you have to know that that's almost an impossibility. The Bible says he gets all of his smartest people together, his magicians and his soothsayers and, 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 and his magi. He gets them all together and he tells them, look, if you all don't tell me my dream, I'm going to wipe you all out. The Bible tells us that Daniel, who was also one of this group because that's where the king put him, Daniel decides he's going to inquire of the Lord and come back and tell King Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. I'm just giving you background so that we can get into this story, even though I only have 20 minutes left. The Bible tells us that Daniel comes in and he tells the king, all right, king, you had a dream. You saw a statue, blah, blah, blah. We remember the statue. Patrick described it for us, right? It was bronze, the head, of, the, the head of gold, the chest plate of silver, of bronze, of iron, and then of iron and clay. And the interpretation of the dream uh, for Nebuchadnezzar was that there were going to be four kingdoms that were going to come out of his kingdom. He was the head of gold. And I'm pretty sure Nebuchadnezzar sitting and listening to Daniel was excited at the fact that he was the first, that he was the head of gold, that gold, which was the most precious metal in that statue. I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar was excited to hear that he was the top dog, that he was the best, that he would be the brightest, that he would be the most enduring metal. And the Bible tells us that King Nebuchadnezzar uh, took this from Daniel and promoted Daniel because not only did Daniel interpret his dream, but Daniel was able to tell him what he dreamt. We're there, right? Fast forward about 20 years. Nebuchadnezzar is, is living and the context of the Bible suggests to us that maybe Nebuchadnezzar is, 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 is serving God or Nebuchadnezzar believes in God because the context of, of Daniel 4 sort of explains to us that Nebuchadnezzar had a relationship with God. And we'll see in Daniel the fourth chapter that here this book of the Bible which was written by Nebuchadnezzar, you all knew Nebuchadnezzar wrote a book of the Bible, you know that right? 
You all know that, right? So, yeah, so all of us who say, oh, you all got to come out of Babylon, a Babylonian king wrote a chapter of the Bible. You all knew that? All right, whatever. We'll talk about that grace next week. Come next week. We'll talk about it next week. But, but the Bible tells us in Daniel, the third chapter, that after 20 years have gone by, Nebuchadnezzar decides what he's going to do is he's going to build a statue that is representative of the statue that he had in his dream. Except for there was a problem with this statue that Nebuchadnezzar uh, set up. The Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar decides uh, that he's going to build a statue only of gold. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar decided in his heart that he was going to build a statue without the manifestations of history that God displayed for him. Nebuchadnezzar basically was saying, God, I know you said a kingdom was going to come out after me, but I'm still here. It's been 20 years since I got that revelation uh, uh, that there was another kingdom coming, and I'm still the top dog. And so what I'm going to do is, because that has not yet happened, I'm going to build this statue as a testament to the fact that I, Nebuchadnezzar, am still here. Bible says after 20 years, he sets up this statue. And if we take a look at it, if we just walk through the text a little bit, Daniel, the third chapter and verse one tells us King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue of 90 feet high, about eight stories and nine feet wide. And he set it up in the plain of Dura. The, then he sent messengers to the high officers and officials and governors and advisors and treasurers and judges and magistrates uh, 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 that this dedication of the statue was going to take place. And King Nebuchadnezzar decides he's going to have this great big service to dedicate this statue. Now, Daniel is, the book of Daniel is all about recurring themes. Can I, can I tell you all, those of you who were here last week, I did not want to preach this week because of what happened in this pulpit last week. If you all were not here last week, go get the tape. I just thought, I just thought about that. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that, 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 that King Nebuchadnezzar sets up this statue, but it alludes to the fact in the last half of Daniel, the second chapter, that this wasn't just King Nebuchadnezzar's idea. Let's take a look at it. Verse 48 of chapter 2, it's not on the screen. Then the king appointed Daniel, this is after he interpreted his dream. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon as well as chief over all of his wise men. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all of the affairs of the province of Babylon while Daniel remained in the king's court. Not everyone that is with you is going to be for you. The Bible suggests that here these men were upset at the fact that here these foreigners came to their country as slaves and now the king has them in charge of everything. Come on, you would be upset, wouldn't you? You would be upset if, if, if slaves came and now they were in charge of everything and, and, and they couldn't handle it. And so, uh, and so the, 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 the modern day, I mean, the modern day, uh, the, the modern day people who weren't excited at the fact of seeing these foreign people in charge of things, they started to act up. You think there's something new under the sun. We see it every day, don't they? They don't like the fact that, there's, that, 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 that there is a son, that, that there's a person in the, in the White House even right now whose face has been kissed by the son who's not necessarily one of them. They don't like him either. So imagine how the people of Babylon felt with these Hebrew people, not Babylonians, being in charge of everything. So they get upset. And for 20 years, they stew on it. And they look for an opportunity to get to set Daniel Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Bible says that some officials come and tell the king, King, you commanded that when the music plays, everybody is to bow down and worship the image that you set up. They come and say, King, 
there's some people that you took from Babylon and that you put in charge who aren't obeying your decree. Okay. I want you all to know that you ought to be careful before you ask God to elevate you. Elevation always brings new levels of hateration. The bigger you are, the bigger the target on your back. The greater you are, the greater your responsibility. The greater your responsibility, the greater your visibility. The greater your visibility, the greater your vulnerability. People will look at you and will be jealous because they would feel that they should have what you should have because God has given it to you instead of giving it to them. But I want to let you all know that God's favor is not fair. So even if you see someone else with favor, you should celebrate the God who gave it to them, not necessarily hate that you're not where they are. The Bible says these haters come and they snitch. And they said, King, there's some people not bowing down. All right. First thing I see in the text is that worship is not something that is forced. This, 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 per, this particular pericope of the Bible is about worship. Uh, not just the position of worship or the heart of worship, but the form of worship. Worship is not prescriptive. There is, no, uh, there is no prescription on how you should worship God. The Bible alludes to the fact that there are many ways to worship God, but no one can tell you this is the way that you have to worship. That is why sometimes I get discouraged with people that feel the only day they could worship is on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is not a day of worship. Every day is a day of worship. Worship to take place in your home every single day, not just on the Sabbath. Now, you can come to church on Sabbath and have an overflow of that worship during the week, but our problem is we get so attached to a day that we forget the fact that God has blessed and created every day. Now, he may have set the Sabbath apart for a special time with you or him, but that setting apart was so that you can come and rest from your wearies. You should worship every day. But, the, but, 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 but worship is, is not something that could be forced. You can't force someone to worship. Worship is supposed to be free and flowing from a heart that has faith to believe that God orders the cosmos, that God keeps you, that if God took his hands off you, you would be gone in an instant. Worship is always turning your heart to God in response of what God has done to you but, or for you. So worship is, worship, worship, worship is free and flowing. That's the first thing I see. Let me go through this real quickly. That's the first thing. The Bible says Nebuchadnezzar gets upset. Bible says in verse 13, I love the way this, the ghetto version puts it. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, I'm in verse four, uh, 13. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now let me stop here. There is a great contrast in the Bible between the God of the Bible and the God, uh, and, and, and the God of the Bible and the God of culture. There, there is, uh, there, uh, the God of the Bible is counterintuitive to the God of culture. Here, Nebuchadnezzar, what he would do is if Nebuchadnezzar conquered your land, he would allow you to bring whatever gods you believed in and bring them over to Babylon. There was a polytheistic society. When he got into, when he invaded Israel, he did not tell the Israelites, you cannot serve the Lord your God, the Most High God. He allowed them to bring their God with them. What Nebuchadnezzar was basically saying was, I let you worship your God, but here I have this new God set up, and you mean to tell me you can't worship your God and give my God just a little bit of time. 
What he's saying is, how is it that you can say that, they, how is it that you can, you can experience my goodness and kindness and then tell me that you're not going to give just my God just a little bit of time? And you may be looking at me kind of funny and say, well, pastor, of course not. But you and I, we do it all the time. Oh, come on, man. Let's be honest. God, we know God says, remember the Sabbath day and go on and keep it holy. But some of us will give the boss a little time on it, won't we? Uh -huh. We know the Bible says thou shalt not steal, but every April 15th, David Defoe, you take a little more deductions than you're supposed to. Or oh, is that just me? Don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody. Erase that from the tape, Brenda. <clears throat> anyway, we, we, we all the time, we, we say that we're all in for God, but all of us, we, we, we give the devil just a little time. We, we say that God is all in all, that we believe in his word, and we believe in faith that he can do anything, but some of us, we doubt. We do the, we're doing the same thing. Nebuchadnezzar says, go on and serve your God. Just give my God a, a little bit of time. And you and I, we think it's so foreign to us. Oh, I would never do that, but we do it every single solitary day. Bible says Nebuchadnezzar is upset. He's angry. Listen to what, he, listen to what these boys say. Bible says, um, Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar says, is this true? And he says to them, but if you refuse, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God, this is verse 15, and then what God would be able to rescue you from my power? <laughs> I'm glad you asked, King Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's, I added that. So replied, O oh Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace... The God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you have set up. First off, let's just deal with Nebuchadnezzar's anger. The king has reason to be angry. Here are some slaves. He took them from their homeland. They belong to him. He has been so gracious to them that he has not only set them up, uh, one of them up as the second in command to the whole kingdom, but he has placed these three boys that are talking to him this way as head over everybody else. They're slaves. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar was upset. If I did something like that for someone and they came to me with that ungrateful behavior, I would throw you into the fiery furnace too. I would be upset with you as well. So we can't get down on King Nebuchadnezzar, but there's something interesting that these young boys say. There are three types of faith. And Martin Luther King in his, in his, in his sermon, what was the name of that? Uh, oh, gosh, what was it? But if not, he, he mentioned, he, he unpacked this text, and he said in, in his sermon that there are three types of faith believers in Jesus. The first are those that have an if faith. They're conditional. They, they say to God, God, if you do this for me, then I will do this for you. It's an if faith. It's the kind of faith that Jacob had. God, if you do this, then I'm going to bless you. An if faith. Then he mentions that there are those people who have a though faith, that, 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 that it was the type of faith that Job had, that, where he was able to say, God, you can take all of my money, you can take all of my clothes, you can take my health, though you slay me, yet I will serve you. But he mentions that there's a third type, this but if not kind of faith that says, God, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter, oh uh, God, if you take everything from me. Even God, if I lose my life, even if you don't spare me, I'm going to believe and trust in you. You know, faith is knowing that God can, but not presuming that God must do what we want him to do, but that he will do what he wants to do. Let me give it to you again. Faith is knowing that God can, but is not, uh, but not presuming that God must do what we want him to do, but that God can and will do what he wants to do. So he's angry. 
And the Bible tells us something interesting. I'm almost done. Tell them to come. Uh, the, Bible, the, 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 the Bible tells us something interesting. The Bible says something interesting. It says Nebuchadnezzar was furious, and he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times. Now, if the furnace is hot, and you make it hotter, and then you make it even hotter than that, how if the furnace was hot the first time, it could get seven times hotter? He was so angry that he figured out a way to, 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 to rival modern physics to make this fire seven times hotter than it was. And the Bible says he did something very devious. The Bible says he went and he got all the clothes that they owned and put them on them. Watch it, he says. So, he, so, so, so uh, verse, 20, verse 21, so they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. This man was going to make sure that they were flammable. He was going to make sure the fire was going to kindle on their no good, sorry selves. Check this out. The Bible says in verse 20, Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and throw them into the burning fire. Do you all remember the people that started snitching on, Dan on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up there in chapter, uh, up there in verse 3? It was some of these same dudes. He said, you know what? Uh, go, get the force, the, go get the strongest ones, bind them, throw them into the fire. The Bible says this fire was so hot that instantly when they threw them into the fire, the people who initially snitched on them and wanted them to be thrown into the fire, the Bible says the flames went on and got them. I want to just park here. And and suggest to you that you have to be careful when you wish mess on other people. Because the mess you wish on other people may just come back to destroy you. So you wish evil on someone else. Just maybe if you wish it on the wrong person, like say your pastor. <laughs> I'm just playing, I'm just playing. It may just come back on you. Bible says the flames that they wanted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to get consumed in, consume them. You don't even got, let me, let me let somebody be free. You, you all don't worry about your haters now, okay? Y'all don't worry about those people that get down on you, that talk about you, that want to stab you in the back. I want to see you taken out. Those people that don't have your best interests at heart, don't worry about ne'er one of them. The fire will get them first. The same thing they wish for you, God going to bring it right to their own front door. All right. All right, let's go. We're going to get out of here. I got one more point. All right, maybe two more. All right. Bible says he threw them into the furnace. He bound them. Okay? And it says, uh, it says he threw them into the fire. And verse 24 tells us something interesting. Now, I want you to know that God did not spare them from the fire. A lot of us think serving God means that we should be immune from difficulty. A lot of us think that because we serve God, we do what God says, we stand up for God, everything should be blue skies and clear skies, and everything should be roses that we should sleep the rest of our lives on a bed of pillows and walk through meadows of yellow flowers. No. Trouble will come. Adversity will knock on your door. Mishaps, misfortunes, they will come. Every one of us, if we serve God, are going to have to go into the fire. But here, this is the good part. Watch this. The Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar, Verse 24, jumped up in amazement as he exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Verse 25 says, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, 
I see four men. But not only do I see four men, but I see them unbound, and they're in this fire that's seven times hotter than any fire has ever been. And I see these dudes in the fire, and they just chilling and walking and sipping lemonade. And that fourth person, that dude that I see in the, in, in, as the first person, this, the ghetto version translates this wrong. It looks like the son of a god. First thing, how in the world did Nebuchadnezzar know that what this person looked like? Bible tells us in, 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 in Daniel, the second chapter, that there was a stone hewn out the mountain that came and crushed the statue. Well, that stone without hands, you know, not made with hands, that stone without hands was probably this same representation that he sees walking in the fire. He says, I see them in the fire, and they're unbound. See, unlike the gods that they served, I'm not, unlike the gods that they served, we serve a God that meets us in the fire. You, you, you see, a lot of us don't understand. We pray so much for God to keep us out of stuff, but we don't realize deliverance is found inside of the fire. It was in the fire that God was allowed, that God allowed their, bind, their, their, their binds to be burned up. It was in the fire that the shackles that had them bound were released. And a lot of times we want God to save us from stuff. Uh, we want God to keep stuff from us, but we don't understand that sometimes our deliverance is found in the fire. It's in the fire that some stuff can get burned off of you. It's in the fire where, 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 where your marriage can come together. It's in the fire where you can, uh, where you can develop uh, deeper endurance. It's in the fire where you can develop greater faith. It's in the fire where God can get some stuff off of you so that he can make out of you what he wants you to be. It's in the fire. But some of us, we're so busy trying to avoid the fire fire. But God shows us in the text that God is not in the business of keeping you out of trouble. God is in the business of keeping you and preserving you or taking you through trouble. God does not want you out of the fire, but he wants to make you fireproof in the fire. He doesn't want you outside of your financial difficulties, but he wants you to be fireproof within your financial difficulties. He doesn't want you outside of the marriage, but he wants to make you fireproof inside of your marriage. He doesn't want you dead. He wants you to be fireproof. He doesn't want you to give up. He wants you to be able to stand even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of your mistakes. He doesn't want you out of them. He wants you to be able to develop the endurance to go through them. I know many of us, we pray and beg and ask God to change the diagnosis. To somehow we become hopeful that our past could change. That's silly. God is not in the business of keeping us out of the fire. He says, when you pass through deep waters. When you go through rivers of difficulty. When you walk through the fire. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He won't move your mountain. God wants to make you a mountain climber. He won't move the obstacle. He wants you to be able to develop the endurance to stand even against those things that come before us to wipe us out. So how in the world can Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walk out this fire and still be smiling when the king talks to them again? God made them fireproof. How is it that we in the midst of adversity can still keep our heads about us? We've been made fireproof. Take a look at this. Last thing, last thing. Let me just give you this one. A lot of us think that evangelism has something to do with, has only things to do with passing out tracts and knocking on doors and, 
And all of that works. It's a good, tried, and true method, and we should do it. But some of us think we, shouldn't, we can't get involved in sharing our faith because we don't do those things. The Bible never told us that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wanted to convert King Nebuchadnezzar. But the Bible says because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego spoke truthful and then stood for true, that King Nebuchadnezzar saw something in them where he recognized that, hey, if their God can do that for them, I wonder if their God could do something for me. I just want to encourage you. You know, as you're on your job, you may think no one's watching you, but they know you go to church. They know you a little more, uh, a little more uh, righteous or a little more sanctimonious, even some of you all, than they are. They're looking at you. They're looking at your example. They're looking at what you do. And some of us, we think that it's really no big deal that, you know, it doesn't really matter what people see me do. It doesn't really matter if I share a kind word. It doesn't really matter if everything in my life pisses me off, but I go to work and I still smile about it. We think it doesn't matter. But here the Bible says Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego never wanted to convert them. They just did what they knew they were supposed to do. And God was able to bless the king of Babylon. So much so, he's canonized in Scripture. Isn't that something? Isn't God good? I just want to encourage you that we serve a God that walks with us through the fire. That he's not a God that stands afar off and wants us to come to him, but he's a God that literally came down to this earth and got into the mess with us. And we serve a God that loves us so much that he goes through whatever it is we're going through. He goes through it with us. Stand with me as we pray. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you, God, that you're so loving, you're so kind, you're so gracious that you walk with us even through the fire. Father, perhaps there's someone today under the sound of my voice and they're dealing with some amount of pain, some amount of difficulty. Father, they're in a tough place. And Father, they've been praying the wrong prayer. They've been praying for you to get them out as opposed to getting them through. But Father, right now, God, if there's anyone today under the sound of my voice that's going through something, you're in a furnace, you're in a fire, you're, you're, you're in a valley, you're, 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 you're going through difficulty, whatever it is, if you know you need God to, instead of getting you out of it, to get you through it, if that's you, just raise your hand. Father, you see our hands, God. We're raising them in faith, believing that you can get into whatever mess we've gotten ourselves into, God. You can get in it with us, God, and you can work it out. Father, you see the hands as diverse as the faces are, so are the problems, God. And so whatever it is that we need, Father, we pray that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, will indwell within us, God, to drive out the frustrations, to drive out the, the, the feelings of wanting to give up, to drive out, God, the lack of faith, Lord, and give us the endurance, God, to take you by the hand and walk with you as you lead us through whatever we go through. Father, we believe in faith that you can help us. We believe in faith, God, that you have all power, Lord, that you are the God who can do even this. So, Father, as every head remains bowed, every eye is closed, perhaps maybe there's someone today that needs to give their life to Jesus. You can put your hands down. If, if there's anyone today that needs to give their life to Jesus, Father, I want to pray for them, God, and ask you to work on them through the power of your Holy Spirit to prick their hearts to make this decision for you. So as every head is bowed, every eye is closed, if that's you, if you know you need to give your heart to Jesus, if you want to join the church, we'll have a baptism in a couple of weeks. If that's you, what I want you to do is I just want you to raise your hand. If you raised your hand for the previous appeal, just put it down. If that's you, then just raise your hand. If you know you need to give your life to Jesus, please, let's take a look. If you know you need to give your life to Jesus, I see your hand. I see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. If that's you, just raise your hand. If that's you, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If that's you, just raise your hand. I'll give you five seconds. If you know you need to give your life to Jesus. If you know you need to give your life to Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank you that even one God has come into a new relationship with you, Father. We pray and we seal that decision. Father, now we ask that you be with us, everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord. And, and we ask that you carry us from this place, believing that you are the God who wants to make us fireproof. And so as we walk through the fire, God, we pray and we thank you for being with us. Father, we love you, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you. In the name of Jesus, I pray that everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.